Thank you for joining us today for our first webinar in our Back to School campaign featuring a panel of youth who will be answering your questions live. I am Ranjit Dangel, VP of Education Engagement at Food Allergy Canada, and I will introduce our panel in just a moment. In today's session, um, the youth panel will share their experiences in managing food allergy in and out of school and how they manage transitions into new and different environments. Specifically, we've broken out the questions we've received into six themes that we'll be going over today. The first is managing in schools, including eating in schools, managing while socializing or in different environments like at parties or friends' houses, sports activities, and so forth how to get the general community like peers, teachers, and more to be educated and supportive of your food allergies, how allergic reactions and anaphylaxis have been handled at school, how to manage bullying because of food allergy, and lastly, uh, we have some general questions. Before we get started, I wanted to note just a few items. Um, please note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. Everyone's muted um, so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions um, when you registered. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you have additional questions, please submit them in the chat question box throughout the webinar. We want to ask as many questions as we can as the purpose of this session is to get your questions answered. So please do submit them. And lastly, this session will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards, so you can watch it again and share it with others. To start, let's do a quick poll to better understand um, who's listening in today, what grade levels you or your children are going into in September. Is it elementary school, middle school, junior high, high school, or post-secondary? So we'll just give a couple of seconds. It looks like majority um, is uh, elementary school, uh, followed by post-secondary. So there's uh, from the youngest to the oldest. So that's great. We have a few panelists who can definitely speak to uh, post-secondary and everybody can share their experiences about elementary as well. Now I'd like to introduce our youth panel for today. Panelists, please turn on your cameras as I introduce you. Uh, Jaden, uh, Jaden's going into grade 12. Jaden, I invite you to turn on your camera. Ashley is also going into grade 12. And Michael and Scott are post-secondary students and twin brothers. Great, I will also now turn on my camera as well. Thank you. We're excited to hear from the panel and we have so many questions, so I'm just gonna jump right in. And to start with, I'll ask each of you to share what foods you're allergic to and when you were diagnosed and what you're most looking forward to to start at the start of the new school year. So maybe I'll start with Jaden. Hi, I'm Jaden. I was diagnosed with food allergies when I was four. My food allergies are to wheat, milk, tree nuts, shellfish, and eggs, among other things. And I'm most looking forward to getting to see my friends again every day when I get back into school. Great. Um, Ashley, you can go next. Hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I am allergic to peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, shellfish, avocado, egg, kiwi, and bananas. Um, and I am most looking forward to just getting a fresh start and also finishing high school and just moving on from that. Hey, Michael? Hey, I'm Michael. Um, I'm allergic to nuts, peanuts, eggs, sesame, peas. Um, and I'm most excited for uh, going into my last year of university and, and getting the most out of it before I graduate. And Scott? Hello everyone, I'm Scott. Um, I'm allergic to the exact same thing as Michael. <laughs> so nuts, peanuts, seafood, eggs, sesame, and peas. Um, you know, I'm, I was diagnosed since I was three years old um, and I'm most looking forward to starting my work term in September. Great, thank you guys for sharing and for introducing yourselves. So we'd love to hear from each of you how you manage food allergy in school. So can you share what you've done in previous school years and what you're planning on doing at the beginning of this school year? So we'll go backwards. So we'll start with you, Scott. Yeah, so um, I always carry on my backpack and have two auto injectors with me at all times. Um, and that's just sort of how I get by day to day, making sure that I'm staying safe. And then in terms of, I always, um, you know, I'm very cautious about, you know, the spaces I'm eating in, 
and where I'm, you know, getting my food from. I like to, you know, stay pretty familiar with the places I'm eating on at campus and in the dining hall. Um, and just in general, you know, I keep pretty, uh, my close peers and, you know, the people I'm interacting with the most very aware of my food allergies. So if I run into a situation where I have a reaction, they're aware of, you know, how to manage it and the severity of it. And, you know, just it's just about strong relationships with your clo- people you're close with, really getting to know the food staff, people who are making your food and how they're preparing it and understanding how that all works. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the main points of how I've been managing my food allergies since I started high school. That's great. And Michael? Yeah, I'd say, you know, pretty similar to my brother. I always carry around two auto injectors, usually one in my backpack and one in my pocket um i'd also say similar as well having a good relationship who's um, managing your food allergies in the context this would be you know residents in first year now that you know i've transitioned out to living in a house um with five other roommates i think it's just educating them making sure they're aware of my allergies and um they're conscientious about that and make sure that um they're good at cleaning stuff up and and just yeah, just being really self-aware and, and giving them all, all they really need to know. Um, and other than that, I'd say similar to Scott, I go to similar eateries on campus all the time. So I develop a relationship with those people. They usually know my allergies and, and this allows each time um, I go to get food, I feel confident. It doesn't feel like I'm a burden. It just develops that good relationship and makes things more efficient and easy to do. Great, hey, Ashley. Yeah, so I would say um, now that I'm in high school, it's kind of just making sure um, before the school year starts that there's a plan in place and kind of refreshing everyone. So usually like a week or two before school, um, I'll just shoot a quick email to the principal and be like, hey, you know, just reminding you I have these allergies, you know, just so that no one's surprised. And then for me, when I was younger and in elementary school, my mom would always just contact the principal before and say, you know, hey, she still has these allergies. These are where her EpiPens are gonna be. Um, And I would say, yeah, definitely. Like if you have different teachers for different classes, just giving them the heads up, like it only takes two minutes to say, hey, I have allergies. These are where my EpiPens are. That way they're not surprised if something does happen, right? Because that way everyone's kind of in the loop and prepared. Um, And other than that, I would say just wash your hands, bring your own lunch or find something safe to eat and here are your EpiPens everywhere. Great. And Jaden? So I agree and do what everyone else says, but I'd just like to stress that I think the most important uh, part is just maintaining the uh, maintaining the fact that you do have food allergies to all the people you're close with. So as Ashley mentioned, right, making sure staff know about your food allergies, but also, as Michael and Scott mentioned, making sure that your friends know about food allergies. Often when I go make a new friend, I'll have to mention that I have food allergies quite early on in the friendship, just because then they aren't surprised later on. And also, of course, uh, one big problem is cross-contamination because it's easy to avoid uh, specific foods. However, for cross-contamination, it's a lot trickier and far fewer people understand. So I make sure to eat foods that I know are likely prepared in a simple manner, not that many steps, so that I can avoid cross-contamination. And of course, I try to bring my own food when possible. Okay, great. Those are great some tips for people. Um, so how do you manage transitions when you're starting a new school? You really, you don't know anybody. You have no friends. You don't know who the teachers are. You don't know who the principal is. So what do you do in those situations? Um, Ashley, maybe I'll start with you this time. Yeah, so I would say the first thing to do is reach out to the principal or whoever is kind of in charge and let them know about your allergies, Um, because usually they can sort of give you some direction of how to approach things. Um, So for me, when I first went into high school, you know, my mom and I just sat down with the principal, had a talk, and then she was able to tell us, you know, that, you know, when I go into each class, I should just introduce myself to the teacher, let them know I have allergies, and that type of thing. So I would say for staff, it's just important to make sure they're aware. Um, And then for friendships, I would say, just try to kind of find people who have similar interests as you, join groups, things like that. And, um, 
I kind of, I don't like come up to someone and be like, hi, I'm actually, I'm allergic to this, this, and this. It usually just kind of comes up naturally. And then, you know, you kind of, a lot of times people will have questions once they find out you have allergies and the conversation just kind of flows from there. Um, so I wouldn't stress too much about it when making new friends. Um, Michael, do you have anything else to add? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. One sec. Um, is this just in the context of like transitions? Is this, is that? Yeah. So this is like yeah. when you're starting a new school and you don't know anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, my ro most recent transition is in the context of going from, um, high school to university. And the first thing I did, I kind of alluded to it earlier um, is the importance of developing a relationship with the food staff who's preparing your food. So two weeks before I moved into residence, I went down with my mom and had a conversation with the chef about my food allergies. This gave us both a common understanding of how the relationship was going to work, how I'd come down and get all my meals each day. And, and what this really made like did for me is it made that transition so much simpler because on the first day, I was at residence. I knew where to get my food. I knew who was preparing it. And it gave me a sense of confidence um, that I was going to have no issues in the cafeteria. I was never going to have to stress about getting a meal. And it just made everything so much easier. Um, so I'd say really emphasize just really developing a relationship with who's developing your food. And I guess in the context of, you know, making new friends, I mean, I don't think it's, you know, as, as Ashley said before, you don't need to be like, hey, my name's Michael. I'm allergic to this, this, and that. I think as the relationship develops, it, it will naturally occur. And it, it definitely depends the context. I mean, anytime you're in a context where you're eating, it will just naturally come up. And, you know, if, if they're friends you should be surrounded by, they'll understand and, and be able to accommodate for that. So I'd say it will just something that occurs naturally. and doesn't, you don't need to stress about it. It will, it will happen. Um, that's kind of my main two points on that okay great so i think that's going to be really helpful for some of the parents on the line um can you share what each of you find most what you found most challenging when managing food allergy at school so maybe i'll start with you Jaden. well initially when i entered a new school because i didn't have very many friends i found it difficult to make friends and even more difficult to tell them about my food allergy right of course as i uh, just grew accustomed to that new environment I became more confident and I was able to tell people about food allergies. I think what would have helped uh, when I was little is just uh, is just a bit of reflection on how quick it is and how not awkward it is, right? I mean, many people already have to uh, inform others of accommodations for their conditions, right? Think disabled people with wheelchairs. So it's just helpful to remind your child or have your child remind yourself themselves that it's not that big, it's not that... Uh, it's not that awkward, really. That's helpful. Um, Scott? Yeah, I think probably the biggest challenge for me transitioning was like, from my experience at Laurier, it was just making sure the food staff really understood, um, you know, what anaphylaxis was, how it needs to be managed, and what, you know, practices need to be in place to make sure I'm safe. I think, you know, it, there's a, they need to understand there's a difference between being vegetarian and having an anaphylactic reaction or being gluten-free and having an anaphylactic reaction. I think that was the hardest you know, part of my experience was them not just treating all the same because it's not one can die, one get a stomach ache, or one's just by choice. You know, So it's really getting them, making sure they understand that. I think the second thing that was the biggest challenge is there's, like, from my experience, you know, I'd have to wait in the massive line to get food, and then I'd get there, and then I'm asking the food staff, they're checking, so it's like, you're delaying the whole line. It feels like there's a lot of pressure, you know, just to get this over with. So I think for me, that was probably, you know, the toughest part, you know, the, it was, it was difficult to sort of manage that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. And we'll get more into post-secondary experiences too later on um, to hear more of that story too. Um, Ashley? Um, I would say my biggest challenge with school and my food allergies was actually just the anxiety um, surrounding the allergies because I mean obviously no one wants to have an allergic reaction and it can be a very scary experience so I think when you're transitioning and you're going somewhere that you're not familiar with and maybe you don't know a lot of people um, you, the allergy stress just kind of adds on to those nerves that are already there 
Um, so I know for me, like going into high school, the first few days, I was so, so anxious, probably like I was shaking the whole day, sweating, like I was so nervous because not only was I this new little grade nine, but I had all these food allergies. Um, so I just tried to remind myself that um, what are the steps that I, I would have to take to have an allergic reaction, right? So I'd say, okay, even if someone at the table next to me has a peanut butter sandwich, yeah, if I go and take that out of their hand and take a bite, I'm going to have a reaction, right? But if I stay at my table with my clean hands and my own food, I'm going to be okay. So it was also just reminding myself to be realistic about what could happen and also that everyone was nervous. So it was totally okay for me to be feeling a bit anxious. Great, thank you. And Michael, what did you find most challenging? I'd say um, the most challenging thing for me, um, even having allergies for so long was disclosure. I mean, it, it, you know, even though I've managed it for so long, it does feel like a bit of a burden when you're in a huge line at university and, um, you know, you have to take the time to disclose all your food allergies and you may feel it kind of holds things up and you may think people, you know, are getting frustrated um, just because, you know, you're causing a clog in the line, but really that's not the case. And this kind of relates specifically back to what I was talking about in terms of having relationships because that doesn't even that makes disclosure so much easier just because I don't even have to disclose my food allergies with them because they already know so um that being the hardest part for me having that relationship really took that barrier away but um that's definitely something I'll continue continually get better at and it's definitely very important and then conversely, on the opposite end, what really surprised you guys? What was something you thought would be super hard, but really it didn't turn out to be that way? Um, maybe Ashley, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, so something that really surprised me was just the willingness of the staff and teachers and how proactive they were. And I think it's really that they appreciate when you take responsibility for your own medical condition. And when you're looking out for yourself, people just want to help you, right? So I found it amazing that, you know, when I went in and told my science teacher, hey, I have these allergies, this is where my EpiPens are on the first day. Um, he was like, okay, we're gonna sit down and you and I are gonna plan some experiments because there's some where I would use eggs. So we're gonna find an alternative together. And it was just so amazing how willing everyone was to kind of step in and make sure I felt comfortable. Um, so it's really just about speaking out because I think as soon as you speak out, um, the right people will help you. Great, um, Michael? I think the the most surprising thing for me is actually how self-aware you know your close friends are that you've disclosed all your allergies to i mean specifically i had a circumstance this was super small where i was about to take a sip out of a buddy's gatorade which with allergies probably isn't you know the smartest idea yeah. drinking out of other people's drinks but um before i took a sip you know he stopped me and and said hey man i had i had a muffin you know two hours earlier it's probably not a smart idea. The muffin probably had egg and that, that's something I'm allergic to. And and just him being that self-aware kind of shocked me because it almost made me think like he's like when he's around me, he's almost thinking about my allergies as much as I am. And, and that really gave me a sense of confidence that, you know, I'm I'm with a good group of people that, you know, if I ran into an issue, there'd be there'd be people there to help. So that was that was probably the most surprising thing for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Scott? Yeah, similar to Mike, I think, um, you know, my peers were really good at helping me manage my food allergies. They understood, you know, living in a house of seven, it gets pretty hectic with mm -hmm. cooking meals and stuff. But, um, you know, they've been very, you know, good about making sure that I'm in an environment where there's no risk of me having a reaction. And Jada? What surprised me most was how knowledgeable the staff of my school were about the symptoms of anaphylaxis. This was my elementary school. I had an anaphylactic reaction and I expected that they would be all panicking, not knowing what to do, but I guess they did their research and my mom informed them properly. So they actually handled it very well, calmed me down, gave me the EpiPen, called the ambulance. It was very quick, uh, it was very quick and very well informed response, which definitely shocked me. Great. Um, we did have a lot of questions also come in around eating 
at school. So how do you feel confident eating in shared spaces at school? Um, maybe Jaden, I'll start with you. Well, I feel confident uh, eating next to people who have the allergen next, the who are eating the allergen because as Ashley said, I just kind of think through the process, okay, what would I have to do to do the reaction? I'd have to get the milk and chug it down, which I'm not gonna do. However, I feel less comfortable the closer there are. So if you're elbow to elbow with someone, right, there's skin to skin contact, then you see more possibility for like crumbs landing in your food or milk landing in your food, right? So some uh, potential cross contamination there. So what I would do is that I would just ask friends to sit apart a little bit so that I don't feel as unsafe. Oh, that's a good tip. Um, Ashley? Yeah, so for me, it's definitely, I've tried lots of different things because I definitely like have more anxiety towards my allergies at times. So I would say for me, um, things I tried to do where um, if I was in the cafeteria, I had my two best friends, right? And they had a limit for three people to a table at my school. So us three would always share a table and my two best friends were like, never brought my allergens were super great. Um, but if there were times where, you know, one of them was away and someone else came and sat. Um, if they did have my, one of my allergens, I'd just make sure there's like a safe distance of how much I felt comfortable. Um, and then also, if I really didn't feel comfortable, I mean, you always have the power to leave, right? Because we can't change what other people are doing. I can't say, hey, you can't eat that. Um, but I can get up if I feel unsafe and I can go somewhere where I feel safer. So I would say, if you're feeling unsafe, just definitely take yourself out of the situation and it's all in your power to do what you're comfortable with. Well, that's a good reminder. Um, Michael? So for me, I'm completely comfortable eating a shared space with all of my allergens, namely because for one, like airborne allergies just aren't, aren't a thing. And I think it's important to know that you're not going to have an allergic reaction from the smell of one of your allergens. But one, one thing I do is, as my brother does as well, we bring wet wipes with us. So we're able to wipe down the space we're eating at. Um, and that helps us feel comfortable. But I think if, you know, the group you're with is, is aware of your allergies, um, then there's no issue, even if they're eating something you're allergic to, because they'll be conscientious of that. They're going to be clean. They're going to clean up their mess. So I don't think you should, you know, stop eating with friends or eating it in the cafeteria just because of your allergies. I think, you know, if you know how to manage an allergic reaction, um, if you have, you know, wet wipes, if you're around people who understand your allergies, there shouldn't be really an issue at all. Uh, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, like similar to Mike, but I think just awareness is like people are, for the most part, you're, you're going to be interacting with people that are reasonable. They're, they won't put you in a situation where, you you know, you're going to have an issue. So I think it's just, you know, making sure everyone's aware and learning how, like, don't live in, we're not here to live in fear. We don't want to, you know, put ourselves, get ourselves out of situation because there's a concern that, like, obviously, we just want to figure out how we can deal with these situations the best, which is just making sure your friends are aware. You're, like as Michael mentioned earlier, bringing wet, wet wipes, just being proactive so you can just have a fine experience eating that mm -hmm. yeah, isn't different than anyone else. Well, you guys are all a little bit older and I know we have a lot of parents and elementary school kids. Is there something maybe one of you can talk about how was it eating at school when you're in elementary school where you don't necessarily have as much control to just get up and leave, for instance, and things like that. So is there somebody that wants to maybe answer that? Oh wait, whoever pipes up first. Okay, Ashley. Yeah, I would say for elementary school, again, it's about comfort level and just being honest with your teachers um, because no one wants you to feel uncomfortable or unsafe. Like that's the last thing that your teachers and people want. So I think it's really about communicating. And you know, if you, most times I think in elementary, you would eat at your desk. So for me, that was always just, okay, I'm eating at my desk and, you know, the people next to me are aware of my allergies. I hope that they don't bring it, but if they do, I know that like my food is here and this is my space. Um, and also just wiping down the desk before I ate, giving my hands a good wash and then just eating my food only, not sharing or anything like that. Um, and you can always speak up if you are uncomfortable and just if someone's sitting right next to you with something, you can always say, hey, 
would you mind like switching seats with someone? I'm just allergic to that. So I don't want to be near it. And usually like people are reasonable, right? So I'm sure that wouldn't be an issue. Um, but yeah, it's all about just your comfort level and doing what is best for you. <clears throat> okay, that's great. Um, some of you have already kind of touched on this a little bit, but we did receive a few questions about anxiety, specifically around being around allergens. So um, one parent asked, my child has peanut allergies, anxious about smelling peanuts in the cafeteria or when eating with friends. Even though she knows she can't have anaphylaxis from the smell, can you provide tips on how to manage that anxiety? So I know uh, you guys all had a bunch of great tips in terms of wiping down and not sharing food, but is there anything else you can share? Maybe Jaden, I'll start with you. Well, if she, if the mm -hmm. child, right, is uh, still worried despite knowing that uh, that the allergen can only be contacted through airborne means, right? That means that it's probably a very emotional thing for her, right? A deep-seated anxiety. So I think the best strategy for managing that would just be to find some close friends and to reaffirm with them, right? That they know that about her, his or her food allergy, that they're concerned for him or her, right? So in that way, the child feels more emotionally secure and then hence will likely not be as anxious. Um, Ashley, I know you mentioned you had some anxieties as well as there, is, can you relate to this and what kind of tips? Oh my you goodness, get? yeah. So when I was in third grade, I had a very bad anaphylactic reaction and my anxiety was so bad that one day I was outside at recess and I saw a Reese's Pieces wrap, empty wrapper um, on the sidewalk outside of like the school area. And that sent me into a full-blown anxiety. They had to call my mom. I was convinced that I was an anaphylaxis just from seeing this Reese's Pieces wrapper that was nowhere near me. So I definitely, definitely understand how the extreme anxiety can come along. Um, and it is so difficult to deal with. So I would say, don't be angry or upset or anything like that because as the person who goes through the anaphylactic reaction it does create some trauma i would say um so even though to other people it may sound irrational for certain fears right like we know that you can't have a reaction by smelling it so it's irrational but for that person it's very very real and very scary so i would say just working on the anxiety overall and then also just kind of practicing like hey maybe i go into the cafeteria with someone i trust and i sit for five minutes and then i go outside and take some breaths of fresh air and kind of like that and just exercising that mental strength so that you can get it to a point where you're comfortable sitting because you know you've done it so many times and nothing has happened okay great thank you um michael i think having a plan in place if you know something were to go wrong, I've had four allergic reactions and use well four anaphylactic allergic reactions and, and used an EpiPen four times, and I've never you know had an issue further than that. I had to go to the hospital and deal with it, and I understand that can be scary for some people, but people I think really need to understand like the mortality rate of food allergies like isn't that high. If you know how to manage it properly, you're gonna you're most likely gonna be fine. So I think it's really educating people and understanding how to manage allergic reaction properly if, if that were to occur um, because you got to live life I don't think I understand anxiety is a part of it but figuring out a way mentally to manage that and having a plan in place if the worst case scenario were to occur would would reduce that and that's kind of what's helped me um, all these years and and not let my food allergies be a barrier for anywhere I eat. Okay that's great advice and Scott? Yeah Mike covered most of it but it's more just trust the EpiPen and your first in instinct should be use the EpiPen. And I think that for me, that is what, you know, doesn't make me anxious. I think always knowing if I have an EpiPen, it's not expired. I trust that it's going to work and I know how to use it. So I'm pretty comfortable. Switching ears a little bit. Um, what's the most reliable way or best way for a student to access their auto injector? So a parent wanted to know if their child should carry the device or store it somewhere? And we all kind of know the answer to this, but I'll let you guys answer. So how do you manage your auto injectors at school? Um, Scott, I'll have you start. Yeah, have it on me at all times. I will always have one in my pocket, always have one in my backpack. Um, you know, the Allerject, what's great about it is it's super small. 
doesn't take up much space in your pocket and it's not much of a pain as what the you know EpiPen, the long EpiPen used to be. So yeah, just always have it on you. And Michael? Yeah, si similar to Scott, um, always have one allergen on you at all times and then have one in your backpack. I'd say, you know, wearing clothing with zip up pockets can kind of help and, and make sure you don't lose, you know, your auto injector. Obviously, that's that may not always be an option, but um, yeah, finding ways to store it so you don't lose it or anything. But 100 percent always have one on you at all times. And I would encourage everyone to have a second as well. Ashley. Yeah, I would say my mom always told me when I was little, treat the EpiPen as if it's part of you. So it always has to be on you. And I know that can be really difficult. Like for me, I would always get the comments, oh, nice fanny pack. And I'd be like, it's not a fanny pack. I would not wear a fanny pack. Like, But <laughs> it's kind of something where you just have to find a way to carry it with you that also makes you feel socially comfortable. Um, so for me, that was, um, I got an allergy alert bracelet, like a medical alert. And then I bought a case for my EpiPens. So when I was going around my school, you know, I just brought the case everywhere. So when I went to class, I had my binder, my pencil case, my EpiPens. When I went to lunch, I put it in my lunch bag. So it was always with me, but then I had this medical alert bracelet. So in the case that, you know, someone's not sure what's going on, they see, oh, she has allergies. Here's this case with the EpiPens, right? So I would say always having it with you, but also finding a way where you feel confident because that's also really, really important. Thank you, and Jaden? Yeah, I think an important thing with carrying your EpiPen on you is to develop it as a sort of habit because I remember as a kid, I would also be quite forgetful. So it's just important to develop the the habit of carrying your EpiPen by just emphasizing how important it is, right? And then eventually it comes to a point where, as Ashley said, it feels like it's part of you and you can't take it off, right? So mm -hmm. just keep establishing that it's a valuable thing. It can be life, it's life-saving, right? And you should always have it all on you. So that way you just slowly build up the habit and then it just becomes a autonomic reflex whenever you go out to carry your EpiPen. Oh, that's great. Um... Scott and Michael, we had a few questions that came in asking how to manage living in res or with roommates. Um, since both of you, I think, had that experience, can you share how you manage and just give a few tips? Maybe Scott, did you want to start? Sure. I think, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, building strong relationships with the people you're around. My Don was aware of my allergies, always had, um, you know, EpiPens, you know, on her and she was actually like right beside my room. So like, Although I was very loaded up on EpiPens, she also had EpiPens, which was, you know, good. I think, you know, my struggle was, like, I, to, to be honest, I had a little challenge in university with managing food, like the food service in the dining hall. Um, there was, it was just hard. There wasn't really a clear understanding of anaphylaxis and stuff like that, which made it a little challenging. So what I did is a lot of my food was, you know, I'd go to the grocery store before the week, I'd you know have, have some stuff that I could snack on constantly, and you know good foods that would fill me up, and then I'd you know go to eateries I was pretty comfortable with, and then you know when the dining hall had food that I was you know confident I could manage, I'd I'd go there. Right, and Michael. So since it's just managing food allergies in residence, is that? Yeah, in res or living with roommates, like how do you kind of manage yeah. Yeah. staying safe? Um. So I've kind of talked on this already a bit, um, but in residence, like I said before, developing that relationship with uh, who's ever preparing your food um, makes it pretty easy. Um, this allowed me to have a broad selection. I had an amazing, amazing experience. I had access to eating at a burrito bar, a stir fry bar, a whole variety of food just because we had a really good relationship and he was always willing to accommodate. So that we lost you there for a little bit, Michael. You're right, Kevin. I can add on to, I didn't really finish okay. mine, so you want me to? Yeah, okay, sure. Like, yeah, you... Just with roommates in general, um, I have all my pots and pans that are just mine. So I have a little basket where I put all my cutlery and everything that I use. So it's like, I'm the only one using it. And I think that's just a really good way to make sure, um, you know, there will be zero issue with cross-contamination there. Um, and generally just, you know, my roommates are great, but I always wipe down all the tables and surfaces before I start cooking something. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully we get Michael back, so we'll just continue. We'll continue on, um, and then uh, when we can. Oh, Michael, you're back. You had 
froze there for a little bit. Can you hear us okay now? Yeah, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you now. Sorry but about that. Um, where where did you lose me? Um, you could just kind of right in the middle. So it was around. Uh, you were talking about building the relationships beforehand. You had a lot of great options. Um, okay. Press, the, but if there's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess yeah, just building relationship gave me a variety of options. Made eating easy in the cafeteria whenever I wanted. So that was what made my residence experience amazing. And then um, just in terms of living with roommates, making sure they're aware. I'd also suggest bringing your own pots and pans because this makes it easy in case um, they uh, they don't clean something maybe as well and they've had something you're allergic to. I'd also suggest if you have a peanut butter allergy, coming to a common understanding with all your roommates that that's something you don't really want in the house. And the only reason I say that is just because of how easily it spreads and it sticks to things, which can make things sort of difficult. But other than that, um, it's, I'd say, pretty pretty straightforward. Okay, great. We did have a question come in. I'm not sure if, I, mean, I think probably it was your parents that were doing this, but specifically around advice for kindergarten children. So besides telling the teacher about um, her allergies, so if the student went in, kindergarten student goes into a classroom and tells her teacher about her allergies, is there anything else um, at that grade or that level uh, advice that you would give? Um, and I know, um, so my son doesn't have food allergy, but he went to school with a few kids who did. And I remember even in kindergarten, one of his classmates would bring her own placemat. Everybody knew around the table where she at, what she was allergic to. Um, so there was a lot of great awareness there. Um, but I don't know if there's other things that you guys can remember back from kindergarten. Ashley? Yeah, so I would say from a very young age, my mom just in like made sure that it was drilled into my head how important the EpiPen was. Um, mm -hmm. and you definitely don't want to scare your child, but I think like, you know, my mom, that when you used to get the trainer EpiPens, it would come with a video, like a DVD. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom and I would always watch that before the school year started, and I would practice with the fake EpiPens. Um, and then I would always just wear them around my waist. And I think at that age, like most kids don't even notice because they all have their different quirks. Some of them have to have their teddy bear, things like that. So it's not a big deal, but I would also say making it known. So know what's going on in the classroom. If there's lunch monitors coming in for lunch, making sure that it's communicated to them that there's this child with food allergies. Um, and also like I see nothing wrong with posting up a sign with their picture and their allergies at the teacher's desk or anything like that. Um, just because the more people that are aware, the better, right? Um, and also, yeah, just having that EpiPen on them and making sure they know that if they're not feeling good, they should tell the teacher. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit and now move on to talking about socializing and different settings. So we had a lot of questions come in about parties. A lot of parents are thinking about um, how to stay safe with parties. So one question was, what motivates you to make safer choices in party set settings? So essentially, how do you stay safe when there might be lots of different food, there might be alcohol involved? So Maybe I'll start with Scott and Michael uh, first. So Scott, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, sure. So like obviously when you get alcohol involved, you know, you're at more risk of the react, the EpiPen and all that stuff is not as effective. You know, it makes the reaction worse and stuff like that. So like, I think, you know, I keep your alcohol, like know your limits, do not go overboard. It's really important that you can be in a state where you're still able to deal with the situation if it occurs. Um, but in general, yeah, like if I'm going, like usually I'm going out with friends I'm pretty confident with and stuff like that. So, you know, if there was a scenario where you know I had too much to drink, they're aware and they know how to deal with the situation. But yeah, I think it's really just staying in control. And Michael? In the context of um, <clears throat> alcohol, I'd say if you're going out for a big night, have a big meal before and maybe um, refrain from eating if, if you're under the influence, just because, you know, kids are, students are going to be students they're going to live life and, and in all honesty they're not always going to make the best decisions um and if they refrain from eating that's kind of a way to mitigate any sort of risk but i'd say other than you know i don't think you always have to refrain from eating but that's definitely one strategy but this kind of goes back again making sure you have a good group of friends around you um in the scenario 
you do have an issue, just, you know, making sure they understand your food allergies. And w so I, I think, you know, you shouldn't let anything prevent you from living life. Just, just being surrounded by good people that will, will take care of you because I mean, I'm in university. I'm, I'm not going to stop having fun because of my food allergies. I just know if I'm with the right group of kids, I won't have an issue. Right. We did have question come in as well about how to, for the younger crowds, um, how do, uh, when kids in elementary school are attending parties on their own. So any tips from past experiences, um, or if you want to also add in um, Ashley and Jaden, I'll ask you guys this question. So Ashley, can you give yeah. me a thought? So I would say when I was younger, you know, my mom would always just get in contact with the parent that was running the party and really just make sure communication was open. So um, my allergies were, I was in a very small elementary school, so my allergies were very well known. So most of the time, if I was invited to a party, the mom or dad running it was already texting my mom being like, hey, Ashley would have gotten this invite today what's the plan, right? So it's like, um, just definitely reaching out and making sure that your child's allergies are known. Um, and then if, you know, you need to, like my mom several times, there would be where, if it was a pizza party, we'd get a pizza that I could have. And my mom would just send me a few slices. And then I would just get that on a paper plate, wash my hands and go. And none of the other kids would notice, right? So it's kind of just like, bringing your own food, eating before, and then just also talking with the other parents about like, hey, these are the limits, you know, this is what's safe and this is what isn't. Um, and at the end of the day, if your child has to miss a party because it's not going to be safe for their allergies, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to matter, right? Because it would, it's better for them to just feel safe. So I would say, yeah, just definitely talking and making your boundaries clear. And do you have any other tips for in high school attending parties? I think you had some great yeah, things. So I would say like definitely eat before. I'm one of those people where I just like would rather eat at home. So I always eat a good meal before. And then it's like, you know, if I'm having some type of drink, whether it's pop or water or whatever, if I have the option to get a can or a bottle that's closed, I'll take that option because then I'm opening it in front of my own eyes. And that's not only for food allergy safety, just like safety in general. I know what's in it, there's ingredients and that's like my go-to. So if it's something that someone's like, if someone's made fruit punch or someone's pouring something out of a random bottle, I'm not gonna go for it. Um, but I would say people don't notice as much as you think they do. So I would always be nervous to be the only one not eating um, at a party. But as I kind of got older and started going to these things, I realized that like, there were usually like 10 other people not eating, you know, and there were so many different reasons that they weren't, but it just becomes kind of a normal thing. And I think everyone's so worried about themselves that they don't even notice whatever you're doing, so. And that's great. And Jaden, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, uh, just a good habit that Ashley and some others already brought up is bring your own food, mostly because kids and teens too, to a degree, aren't the best with impulse control. So it's better to just give them, I'm personally a snacker, but just give them some food and drink that they can reliably and safely snack on during the duration of the party. It helps them feel safer. And then also, of course, it avoids the impulse of wanting to try new food or wanting to drink something just because you feel thirsty or hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, what are some different strategies that you guys have all used when going out with friends? So like if you're going to somebody's house, for instance, or going out to eat somewhere, um, I think you guys have all touched on various different things. So if there's stuff that you want to add. Um, so Michael, I'll start with you. It's kind of the same message I've been iterating throughout most of the questions. It's just general awareness. We want to educate people and we don't want to scare them because if we scare them, we're putting ourselves backwards into making people aware of food allergies. And one way to not scare people um, with food allergies is making them aware, having them accommodate, but living life in, in, normally. Don't, don't let food allergies be the barrier that stops you from living life. So if I'm going over to a friend's for dinner or I'm eating at a friend's, and I'll make sure they're aware of my allergies. I'll make sure they understand the importance of cross-contamination, but I'm not just going to go out and 
not eat with my friends just because I have allergies. So I think mainly just educating people. That's that's really, I think, what it comes down to. And Scott, would you like to add? Yeah, have a plan. Be proactive. Going out to restaurants, you know the restaurant you're going to, call them before, get an understanding if they can manage food allergies, what options exist. It makes the whole process when you get there super easy. Um, same with going out with friends. If you have plans in place, you're going out to friends for dinner, then just let them know your allergies. Be pr proactive about everything. Okay, great. This kind of goes into uh, go going further into, but it, rather than um, how to manage food that's prepared, because you guys have already kind of answered that, it's from your past experiences, were there some easy errors to watch out for? So if somebody else was making food for you and uh, was there a mistake that you made that you learned from or anything like that, um, Jaden or Ashley? Ashley? Yeah, I would say for like restaurants, um, you have to be careful because not only sometimes people will think you're saying that you're vegan or something like that. So you have to make it clear that it's a serious allergy. Um, and also you just have to look out for the signs that, you know, the waiter or waitress is really paying attention. Cause I know sometimes I've gotten that server. That's like a yes man. And it's like, is this peanut free? Yes. Does this have sesame? No. And they're just giving you the answers that they think you want to hear. Um, so I would say just definitely like fact check, make sure that the info they're giving you is true. Um, and don't rush through it. I mean, even though it feels like there's pressure to kind of get it done as quickly as possible, I would rather take the time to make sure the food that I'm getting is safe than take the time to like do the EpiPen and go to the hospital and stuff. Um, so yeah, I would say take your time and just fact check, make sure that you're really getting what is in the food. Mm -hmm. And, and Jaden, do you have more to add? One thing that helps with fact checking is knowing exactly what's in the food. This is a lot easier to do with simple foods. That's why for me, uh, sushi restaurants have always been a favorite because it's usually pretty clear what goes into that ingredient, right? As opposed to pizza, for example, all sorts of things could be put into a pizza, right? So mm -hmm. having simple foods that uh, don't have that many complex ingredients is definitely helpful because it's easier to clarify what's going into what. And it's also easier to avoid cross-contamination just because there are fewer steps to making that particular food. Great, thank you. Um, we had a few questions come in um, around activities and events. So this question was from um, a parent saying, what can they do to help you not feel excluded from activities or events due to your food allergy? Um, so I thought that was a great question to ask. Um, so Michael, uh, you're shaking your head or nodding your head, so you have something to say. Yeah, no, again, I think it's just, really what i what i've been saying don't don't make you know allergies to define how how you live your life live live life live life like any normal person um sorry could you re reiterate the question again so, Just yeah sure. the, yeah no problem and then i'll even tie it into the sporting activity so uh the parent had asked uh can, what can they do to help you or their child not feel excluded from activities or events due to your food allergy so maybe it's things like you know, if their child is nervous about something, practicing a scenario, or um, I think a few of you have already mentioned, you know, packing foods and, and things like that. So it's, I'd imagine um, she maybe was talking about field trips or overnight camps or things like that um, from school. So that they might have excluded their child from before. So what, um, so what are, I guess are tips from, for parents? Um, I think it's really just as simple as plan and, and be proactive and don't let don't let food allergies prevent you from doing things. That's really all I got to say with that. Provide just, you know, understand what the allergies are and, you know, provide options that they can eat. Like, I think it's as simple as that. I've been in many situations in my life where I can't eat certain foods and I sort of understand that it sort of is what it is. And it's not something that really mm -hmm. bothers me. Um, but, you know, if you have options that are safe and, you you know, make sure that something you can eat, I think that's great. That, eliminates the barrier immediately um and tying into that question was around uh sporting activities so uh, a bunch of questions came in although we didn't get a lot of people from middle school there but there were a few questions from middle schools how to navigate allergies with sporting activities so i know michael and scott i think you're um quite involved in sports do you guys have any quick tips yeah um 
you know, we were big skiers, so just sporting events in general, we're always traveling. We're always, you know, put in a situation where we're going to need to disclose our food allergies and we're eating out all the time. So I think it's just, again, you know, disclosure, um, prepare, make sure, you know, you, usually there will be some, you know, plan for your sporting activity. Like you're going here then you're having lunch at here and you're having all those games. Call the restaurant before, pack food, have snacks. You know, just be prepared. I think it's, it's really as it's it's as simple as that. Like I've been to, all over the world ski racing. Um, I've been to Europe and just using those steps and you know having a plan in place, you can do it. Like it's 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 very, um, you know, you can navigate it well. Michael, do you have anything more to add? He pretty much covered it all. I mean, I don't think like actually during the event you need to have your EpiPen on you, but. If, you know, it's in the context of, say, a soccer game or a hockey game, maybe bring one on the bench or keep something close around in the dressing room. Just make sure it's in the general vicinity of the sporting event. But other than that, I'd say I just agree with everything Scott said. Um, nothing more to add, really. Okay, great. Um, let's switch it up now to the general community. So how do you get people like your peers, teachers, to be educated and supportive of your food allergies? And so at what age did you feel comfortable advocating for yourself and your allergies? And then we also did have a question come in um, tied to that of when and how should parents start teaching their child about their food allergy? So um, maybe Jaden, I'll start with you. All right, so I was first aware of my food allergies from a pretty young age. I think even in first and second grade, I had an idea that it was this very severe sickness I could get if I ingested a certain type of food. I think it's very important to have a uh, kids be educated early because it's actually they're at the greatest risk when they're young right it's difficult for them to control impulses or make decisions when they're young right as you grow older you become more experienced you're better able to control yourself but then when you're young it's far more difficult the important thing when Kelly and peers about food allergies is to kind of walk the tightrope between being too serious as to scare them off and being too casual as to make allergies seem unimportant so uh, as some people have mentioned before, it's good to bring it up in casual conversation later on, not just say immediately, hey, I'm Jade and I have food allergies, but then you also have to emphasize the particular uh, effects, the particular symptoms, so that they know it's a severe condition. That's great. Ashley? Yeah, so I would say, like, honestly, the earlier the better to start educating your child because then it kind of becomes part of their lifestyle. And it's just something that they've always known. So it's not going to be all of a sudden like, oh, wait, I have to read labels and what the heck. Like, if it's something they kind of grow up practicing, then it should be just like a more seamless transition and do taking responsibility for themselves. So I know for me, like, my mom kind of made a game out of it. When I was little, I was just allergic to peanuts. So I remember when I would, you know, when we'd go grocery shopping for snacks for school, my mom would say, okay, this is what the peanut free symbol looks like. Okay. So if a food has that, you can have it. And then she would tell me, you know, find anything you want with the peanut free symbol and I'll buy it for you to bring to school. So then I'd be like five years old running through like looking, okay, this doesn't have it. Oh, this has it. I can have these, you know? Um, so it really taught me like that. I need to look at the labels and it kind of made it fun for me to find different treats that I could have and my mom would buy for me. So it's kind of just, yeah, just not making it super serious, just kind of teaching them like, Oh, Maybe, you know, if it has this symbol, that's what this means, and you can have that, right? So it's kind of educating in a fun way. Michael and Scott? Yeah. Michael, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Scott, you want okay. to go? Okay, yeah, sure. No, tell them right away. Like, there should be no hesitancy in, uh, you know, making sure your children are aware of their allergies. You will never know when you're going to be in a situation where food is there and you're not going to be there or someone doesn't exactly know what they're allergic to. So like educate them right away. Um, yeah. Um, I'd agree with Scott. Managing food allergies, it can seem really complicated, but honestly, it's, it's really simple. Um, and if they understand how to educate people really early on, I mean, if, if kids learn really re early on, as Ashley said, they, they develop these habits and, and it becomes progressively easier to manage um, going forward based on your experience. 
Um, before we move on to allergic reactions and bullying, uh, our last two topics, we had a great question that just came in with, how can parents best support you without seeming to be too overbearing or controlling? So um, do you guys have any thoughts on that, Ashley? Do you? And then Jaden, I'll go to you after. Yeah, so I know like a lot of times the kids want to be independent and they want to take charge. Um, but also I would say don't let your kids lie to themselves because when I was younger, I would lie to myself about certain things because, you know, I wanted to eat something or I didn't want to wear my happy pen to this. So I'd be like, oh, it'll be fine. So it really took my mom being the realistic one saying, no, you need to have your happy pen. I don't care what it looks like. You have to have it. Right. So it's like making sure that even though they can make their own decisions, making sure it's realistic. And sometimes you will have to be the Debbie Downer and say, no, you're not doing that because it's not safe. And that's the end, period. Um, so I think, yeah, just kind of, you might have to be a bit annoying sometimes, but um, it's better for their safety. Um, and then also just having like, kind of nonchalant ways to make sure they have their EpiPen. So I know, like my mom would drive me to school every morning in elementary. So we'd get in the car and she'd say, are you buckled? Yep, do you have your EpiPen? Yep, and then we'd go. So that was our daily routine. And I knew she was gonna ask the same way she would ask if I was buckled. Um, so it didn't really bother me. So just things like that. Great, and Jaden? Yes, I'd like to agree. I'd agree that uh, building those allergy safe habits early is very important, even if that means you have to be overbearing. Because yes, it may be a bit annoying for a child to not be able to attend a certain party or not be able to eat a certain food, right? But just remember that in a few years, they'll likely forget about it. And what's even better is that when they become more independent, when they grow older, they will have developed the habits that you help to instill. And then that will help them be able to exercise allergy safe behavior on their own. So basically what I'm saying is that if you enforce the habits when they're young, then you won't have to do it when they're older. And it will be far more awkward if you have to do it when they're older. Um, Michael? Uh, I think just being consistent with the message you give across to your kids. Um, and like um, talked about before, they'll, they'll develop these habits and you'll get to a certain point where you're, you're no longer going to have to convey those same messages to your kids because it will just be natural and it'll be just their, their instinct. So I think being consistent, especially when they're young, helps helps develop these habits and they'll stick with you for a while. And Scott? Yeah, I think I agree with, you know, every what everyone said. I think it's one of those things where, you know, there's going to be a point where you're just going to have to trust them. So like, you know, consistent message. I think don't put, it's not like there's ways to manage it effectively. Um, yeah, and just know, know what works, know what you're doing. I don't think you shouldn't, let your kid go and do something because there's a risk of, you know, some foods being eaten here. That shouldn't be a reason you're not being involved. I think you just need to figure out ways to manage it, have a consistent message and figure out, you know, ways you can, practices you can have in place to make sure what your kid's doing is safe and everything. But I don't think you should not be going to something because there's potential risk of allergens there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. Now, Ashley, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add that, you know, they're going to feel like you're controlling their life anyway, so it's important to just make sure they're safe, but sometimes it can be helpful to make them feel like they're making the decision, right? So I know there was times when I'd want to go to like a fair or something, and my mom would just sit down with me and say, okay, we know that these foods are going to be at the fair. This is what's going to go on. These are the potential risks, and she would ask me how do you feel about going? And we would make that decision together. And I think that's a lot better than just telling them, nope, I've decided that you're not going. I think it's really good to tell them the risks and see how they feel about it. That way they feel like they're a part of the decision. And it also makes them feel more confident when making decisions about their allergies in the future. That's great, thank you. Um, we're going to go a little bit over just because we still have some great questions, particularly around anaphylaxis and bullying that I want to get to. Um, so uh, thank you guys for staying on a tiny bit longer, hopefully just about another 10 minutes or so. 
So um, we're moving on to allergic reactions. And I know a few of you have already kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, so I'll start with you, Michael, in terms of, can you share your experience of having an allergic reaction at school and how you recognized it was anaphylaxis, what you did and what you learned from the experience? Yeah, sure. So my, um, the most recent time I, I had to use the EpiPen was, I was in grade 12. I went to a boarding school. I was at a ski academy and I had um, a protein shake uh, and it was a vegan protein powder. And one thing people got to be aware of, especially if you have a pea allergy, is that is a huge protein that they put in, in vegan supplements. And the tough thing about um, the ingredients listing is they had medical and, and non-medical ingredients. So I wasn't, I only read one of those ingredients lists and I, and I missed the fact that there was um, pea protein in it. This resulted in me having an allergic reaction. Um, my face swelled up, um, my lips got swelled, my throat was sore. I knew it was anaphylaxis as soon as I realized I was experiencing more than one symptom and called my mom and kind of discussed it. There was really no hesitation in using the EpiPen just because as Scott said before, within doubt, use the EpiPen. It's not gonna cause you any harm. And so that's what I did. I mean, then I went to the hospital and it was, it was properly managed, but my, my like big learning experience from that was just making sure you're careful and diligent in, in like reading all the ingredients list, especially with health supplements that don't have typical um, food labeling that you'd see at for a normal product at the grocery store. Yeah, that's great. Um, Jaden or Ashley, do you want to share your experiences? Yeah, so I know I did have a reaction at school in grade nine. Um, and for me, like having a reaction at school was always my worst nightmare. Um, and I was always so scared of like, what would happen? I honestly, it's silly, but I felt kind of awkward with like about it. Like, how do you walk up to someone and be like, um, I'm an anaphylaxis. Like, I just felt awkward about it. And you shouldn't, but I did. Um, so in grade nine, the one day I just, I ate lunch, the lunch that I brought, um, and we're assuming it was from just some accidental cross-contamination from the table or something in the cafeteria. Um, but I quickly ate and I went to my next class and then I kind of, my stomach started hurting. Um, and for me, I was like, okay, it's a stomach ache. It happens to everyone. Let's just see how I'm feeling. And then as soon as I kind of started feeling lightheaded and weird, I knew that it was anaphylaxis. So right away I got, I just raised my hand and said to the teacher, listen, these are the symptoms I'm feeling. As you know, I have allergies, like something's going on. Um, so right away I was given the EpiPen and like they took me down to the office, called an ambulance. And I was just so relieved because in you know my mind before it had happened i thought um similar to what Jaden said earlier i thought people would be panicking and not knowing what to do but it was like everyone knew what to do everyone had a job you know someone went and got my backpack someone stayed with me someone called my mom like there were so many different people helping out and it just went so smoothly so um it definitely just reassured me a lot that when it really comes down to it the teachers especially they know what to do and they're gonna do it and you know you don't realize how much time the staff puts in to those they have those meetings before school and those staff meetings where they discuss okay what's our plan right so even though you might be worried there is usually a plan and it'll go a lot smoother than you think Jane, do you want to add anything further i know you talked about your reaction earlier could you refer could you say the question again i didn't right. hear yeah, no, I was just sharing your, um, if you've had anaphylaxis at school, which you mentioned you did in grade three and it went smoother than you thought um, and uh, what you kind of learned from it. Uh, I don't know if you've had any further post grade three. Oh, and, then I'll yeah. actually, and then I'll actually tie into, um, so you guys can think about it, a uh, question that came in um, right uh, as the session was beginning with, and I'll just read it verbatim. So my daughter is starting high school in September. What steps would you recommend taking with respect to her anaphylaxis management at school, considering there are a lot more teachers involved? In elementary, she only had two teachers each year, so I would meet with them and talk to them at the beginning of the year, but high school seems very different. Um, so um, Jaden, I'll let you talk about your anaphylaxis story, and then if you wanna talk about that too. Yeah, okay, so the anaphylaxis story. In sixth grade, I had a project where I had to make a pizza out of various different foods that uh, is, is a French project. 
but that's not the important part. The important part is that I had foods, of course, so for example, rice flour and meatballs that I believed would be allergy safe. Unfortunately, there was some cross-contamination and as a result, I had, uh, anaf I had anaphylaxis. Now, as Ashley has said, right, the staff are generally quite well prepared for anaphylaxis. However, they aren't so well prepared and aren't so well educated about cross-contamination. So I think it's important to inform them about what could uh, occur during cross-contamination and also to know the process in which your uh, food, the food is prepared. So maybe even if there's a project where you have to eat a food, but let's just say for the cafeteria, right? It would be important to think, to uh, question and uh, make sure you know about something like, where does this food come from? How is it distributed? Who handles it, right? Just so that you can identify and probably clarify that you have food allergies that could be spread through cross-contamination to every step of the distribution process. Great. Um, Michael or Scott, do you have anything to add, particularly around the parents' question around anaphylaxis management in school? Michael? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I really, again, just think it, it comes down to education. Not everyone's going to be able to accommodate what they eat for your allergies. So having a plan in place and bringing things like wet wipes make these situations a lot easier to eat in school. Always carrying an EpiPen. I think if you really do those three things, no matter what food you're around or what you're surrounded with, you're, you're always going to be able to manage your food allergies safely. Just to add, I think you know, when you're, yeah, obviously you're going to have probably, depending on how your school system is, if it's semester based or not, you will I don't know, four to eight teachers, uh, send out an email at the beginning of the year. Just make them all aware. And I think that's a great strategy to just get it all started on, you know, the importance of your allergies and then, you know, meet with them, just to introduce yourself, make sure they know your face. I think that's important. I, you know, high school classes are relatively small compared to universities, but I think if they're familiar with the face. It will not be an issue. Great, thank you. <clears throat> we also have some great resources on our site um, around anaphylaxis, particularly our you know, treated campaign to where people across the country are talking about um, their anaphylaxis story. So similar to how Jean Scott, Michael and Ashley just did now. Um, and we have a great video with youth that um, expand on that too. So if you go to your handout section, there's links there for you. Um, now the last section is about bullying. We had a lot of questions come in about how to manage bullying. One parent asked, how do you respond to what may seem as bullying or ridicule because you have to get special meals in the cafeteria or dining hall? So I don't know if uh, people on the panel have had a lot of experience with bullying um, or like jokes around allergies. So if you can share um, what your experiences are and what you recommend uh, for others if they face similar situations. So um, maybe Scott, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where you're going to get comments. And I think for the most part, you know, there's no malicious intent behind what they're saying. They just think they're being funny. They're trying to get a laugh out of their peers. And I understand that. Um, and it's sort of something, you know, I'd say like, hey, I'm not a fan of that comment. You know, I'd appreciate it if you didn't say that. And I think when you're, you know, sincere about it and stuff like that, and they really understand that it's not something you like, most people are pretty good about understanding that. So I think, you know, you know, just telling them it's not what, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. It's a very life-threatening, something I have to deal with, and I don't appreciate those comments. I think it's as simple as that, um, and yeah. Great. Jaden, do you have any experiences yeah. to share? Uh, that strategy definitely works for the majority of people, right, who may make offhand comments about food allergies, uh, not being malicious, but just out of ignorance, right? However, there are some people who oh, would more specifically bully instead of just tease that may have more malicious intent, right? Or even if they don't have more malicious intent, it could be more severe. And there, I think it would be just more useful to ignore them and to stay within your good circle of friends, to establish a good circle of friends. Because the problem is often, if you respond to more severe bullying, right? And that could just intensify and cause even more problems. Um, Michael, and then I'll go to you, Ashley. Yeah, I think both um, what Scott and Jaden said are, are both great comments. Um, I think, you know, yeah, responding, it's not, there, it could possibly be a malicious intent or it could not be. I'd say ignoring them's a good strategy. 
But I mean, at the end of the day, if it's really becoming an issue where you feel that, uh, you know, you're, you're at risk because of these people, it's ignorance, I'd say, um, get it, get it, it's all involved. I mean, it obviously depends. I mean, it's more in the context of like, if you're in elementary school or, or maybe middle school, but yeah, don't, don't get afraid to get someone else involved. It's a pretty serious thing. And if you're not able to convey, um, to them a good understanding of the severity of feed allergies then maybe coming from an adult figure they'll be able to and we'll stop so i i really think you know this all comes down to education um is a big way of preventing these things and people understanding it but if they're just ignorant and they understand it and they're doing it anyway well ignore them or get someone else involved because it's not really a person you want to surround yourself by and uh thank you and ashley yeah, so I would say for that particular situation that you read, um, sometimes it can just be a bit of like jealousy or like sometimes kids are like, well, why is this person getting a special lunch? and I have to eat the same lunch as everyone else. So I would say just kind of like reminding them like it annoys you. Imagine how much it annoys me that like I have to live with this every day. You know what I mean? Um, so just running them that like it's not for attention and it's not like you went and were like, hey, I would like to be allergic to this, this, and this, thank you, right? It's not a choice. So just reminding them that like, it's annoying for you as well. And it's not something fun to deal with. Um, and then for bullying, like, I think there's so many channels to go through for me, like I dealt with more severe bullying. Um, so, you know, I really didn't realize how many resources there are, you know, and I think like, Food Allergy Canada is such a great organization to contact. You know, for me, they had a speaker come in and do an assembly and talk to my whole school about food allergies and how important they are. Um, so there's definitely like just so many different levels of um, help that you can get if it does become a problem. So I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't stress there is support if you need it, but in most cases it can kind of be resolved with just, you know, your child just reminding them like, hey, if you're annoyed by it, imagine living my life. Like I'm annoyed by it 24 seven, right? So yeah, just kind of taking it one step at a time. We also do have resources on our site as well, um, particularly for those parents who have kids under the age of 15, um, so 7 to 15, we have a great program called Allergy Pals and Allies where they do talk about bullying um, in there. Um, so the next session starts next month and oftentimes the participants have talked about it being very life-changing because they're introduced to a whole new peer group that completely understands what they're going through. Um, so uh, you'll get some more information about that at the end as well. Um, I think I'm going to just, in due to time, I'm going to skip down to kind of wrapping it up and getting kind of a summary. So if there's, we've talked about a lot of things in here. So before we wrap up, can each of you summarize your top points on what you want to make sure the parents that are listening in um, know about managing food allergy in schools and other settings? So what would you tell them the top two things. So Michael, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I think it's really as simple as educate, don't scare them, come across in a tone where you're trying to educate them and, and not frighten them because if you frighten them, no one's gonna help you manage the food, your food allergies. They're gonna avoid because they're scared. Educate in a calm, calm way where they understand, there's a balance between understanding the severity of it. Um, I, I, I really think that's honestly just, kind of the words I live by if we want to move forward and and help the world for kids living with anaphylaxis people need to be educated they don't need to be scared off so I think really emphasizing that point is is kind of where I'd go okay. Ashley yeah I would say the main thing that I would say is everyone makes mistakes and it's okay so like I know my mom there were times where I had reactions and she blamed herself because she felt like she'd made a mistake and that's the reason why that happened right so i would say like everyone makes mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes and you don't need to be hard on yourself because food allergies are a difficult thing to kind of you know get around so it's just making sure that you do the proper treatment and take the proper steps and as long as you're trying as best you can 
your child is going to see that and they're going to know that you care. So they're not going to blame you. My top tip would just be, don't be down on it. Don't be down on yourself if something does happen. Um, and also, if you're having anxiety about their allergies, deal with that yourself. Don't transfer that anxiety to them because you want them to know that their food allergies are serious, but look at it in a positive light. So I completely understand like your child is your everything and you're worried about them. And this allergy just gives you more worry. But I think you need to definitely deal with that on your own terms and make sure you don't transfer that anxiety to them because then that would create allergies like more allergy anxiety for them as well great thank you ashley that's great scott yeah plan pro be proactive educate and then when in doubt epi it out always trust the epi pen if you're in a situation where you need to use the epi pen use it don't don't go to benadryl don't go to any antihistamines use the epi pen Perfect. And Jaden? I think an important thing is just instill uh, good habits in your child. So for example, carry the EpiPen. Uh, if you feel unsafe, wipe down the surfaces. Use the, uh, these are the symptoms of anaphylaxis. Use EpiPen when that happens. So that way, right, you don't want to be, uh, you can say, what's a good word, babying them their whole life. Eventually they're going to grow older when they need to become more independent and take more responsibility for their lives. So if you can instill the good habits early, right, when they're young, then it will be easier when they're older. They already have the, I, they'll have an idea of what to do with their food allergy. So it's all about instilling those proper habits. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks for your amazing insight, for staying later, for imparting the wisdom to parents. Um, we're going to wrap up the session, so I invite you to turn off the webcams. Um, and uh, we'll put the slides back up and talk about what's next. So uh, we do have a post-session survey that you're going to get right away after this um, session. Please do take a moment to complete that survey. It really helps us improve our programming um, and it provides us with insight on other topics you would like us to cover. We have a host of back-to-school resources on our site, so be sure to check them out at foodallergycanada.ca slash back-to-school. There you'll find videos, handouts, hacks, and more. Please also do get involved in our More Than Peanut social campaign. That's all about creating awareness for all allergens. Um, all you need to do really is just share the post and that'll greatly help us broaden the reach of the campaign and make sure we get the conversations going across the country. Um, coming up next, we have a webinar on Wednesday on oral food challenges and why they're important particularly as allergies may change over time. So whether your kids are starting school or leaving to go to post-secondary, oral food challenges can provide more info to help your child manage their food allergy better. Session, the session is on uh, October, uh, October, sorry, August 24th. Uh, that's next week, next Wednesday, and it'll be presented by Dr. Edmund Chan. So don't miss out. You can register at foodallergycanada.ca slash events. And as I mentioned earlier as well, if you have kids aged seven to 15, Sign up for the next session of Allergy Pals Allies. It truly is an amazing forum and helps to build a really strong peer group. As you know, uh, Food Allergy Canada is a non-for-profit charity. We're completely reliant on donations for the support of the work that we do, like these sessions. Um, if, you consider, if you can consider a donation to our organization, we would so greatly appreciate it. You can visit foodallergycanada.ca slash donate to learn more about the impact your donations would make. And I'd also really like to thank our sponsors for this event under our Back to School campaign, the Peanut Bureau of Canada, DEA, and EpiPen. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. You can view a recording of this session at foodallergycanada.ca shortly. And please also share with others who may benefit. This now concludes the webinar. <laughs>